another episode of The World Beyond Belief. We're delighted you've joined us again today. I'm your co-host, Mindy Erkin, and with me today, as always, is your host, Dr. Paul Marco. Today, we have an extraordinary show because we are joined by two very special people, Ella Draper and Abraham Christie. You may remember Ella, who is the mother of the two children from Hampstead who came forward to talk about what happens to them every day when they go to school. Um, if you are not familiar with the case, you might want to have a look at a couple of our previous podcasts, specifically number 133, 135, and 137 to catch up on the background information. But we're joined by Ellen Abraham, and actually this is a compilation of several conversations we've had with them over the last week. So thank you again for tuning in, and here we go. This is uh, the last couple podcasts we've done. Some of our podcasts are a little more lightweight. Some of them are <clears throat> a little bit, uh, maybe, maybe even humorous. But some of them are really serious, and uh, we've gotten into some really serious topics like uh, the Daniel Smith case with MMS, and our Hempstead case, and some others that, I, that aren't springing to mind right now. <clears throat> but this is probably the most critical, the most, um, I don't know, impactful uh cases that we've ever presented and uh, we've got people we've got the two people that are involved to talk today you know it's funny that this interview is occurring the week before of the, the Bilderberg meeting and while we're all sitting on our hands waiting for the TPP the Trans-Pacific Partnership to, to come forward and during these two situations we're totally at effect like, what are they going to do to us? What are they going to bring on us now? You know, what kind of restrictions? How can we... <clears throat> but in this particular case, the case that we're going to be talking about today, it's the opposite. It's a David and Goliath moment. It's, it's, their, it's their Achilles heel. It's their weak spot. They can't continue global dominance without this practice. And they can't continue this practice with awake human consciousness around. So the purpose of this interview and the purpose of probably the world beyond belief is to try to, to put as many people as we can in touch with this reality that's going on so that we can collectively put a stop to it. And we can collectively put a stop to it. What I'm talking about today is the Hampstead case. Today we have with us Ella and Abraham, the two parents that uh, were shocked when the children came forward with the news of what had been happening to them. Now, I, I want to, during this interview with them, this is going to be one of the series of interviews, but this first interview, I want you to really get to know Ella and Abraham. I want you to get to know them the way Mindy and I have gotten to know them. Got to know them as people, people that are standing up against the system that seems to be all-powerful, but it's not. So we're going to talk to them about situations surrounding the case, how this thing happened, and, uh, and then we're going to go from there. I want to first start off with, with Ella. During a holiday in Morocco with the children, they were observed, uh, they observed their children misbehaving. Let me continue with my story. Well, anyway, they discovered this strange behavior and uh, they came back and they, were, they, were, they continued to observe the children. But the children were now coming forth with these stories. Um, Ella and Abraham were able to get the children to trust them enough to betray their sacred um, oath to their coven. 
So they uh, so they started telling the story about this this Wednesday sex at school where all the teachers and most of all their father uh, named Ricky Dearman would come in and uh, have sex with them. Of course, they would give them treats and money, but um, you know this was a horrible thing that was happening. And they said that the whole school was involved, and they named the teachers, and they described the teachers' anatomies, since they were obviously intimate with these teachers. If you want to hear the kids' testimony, go to the second half of podcast 133. Second half, start the second half, and you'll get all their testimony, except the testimony that they gave to the police, which I think is even more incriminating, and you can find that all over YouTube. Now, how the testimony that they gave to the police got on YouTube is a big question in my mind. But anyway, the parents come home, Ella and Abraham came home, and of course, they wanted to report it to the authorities. And subsequently, well, I'll let them tell you the story, but subsequently the child's Children were taken away, and uh, they've had to leave the country because the uh, judiciary system has twisted it and accusing Ella and Abraham, which is pretty outrageous. If you have any ability to reason at all and think about motives and actions and possibility, you'll find that it's a clear-cut case. Anyway. Let's talk a little bit about this whole satanic ritual stuff and how this glues everything together and how if we can pull the string out of this thing, it'll collapse everything. You see, the earth now and humankind is in the grips of a satanic death cult. Um, people in positions of power, and I would say all people in positions of power, are either influenced directly uh, and under the thumb of people who do this or actually participate in this themselves. All you need to do is refer to Bohemian Grove. Now, Bohemian Grove is a ritual. It's a death cult ritual that happens every summer in Southern California, or I guess it's Central California. This is a cremation. They, what they do is they perform a cremation of care ceremony to the god Moloch. Now, Moloch is an ancient Canaan god of, of fire and destruction. Now, the reason that they do this, the reason that you perform this type of ceremony, is to ensure financial, your financial success. Your financial success. Not the country's, not everything. It's just all about you, which is the first, the first uh, tendency of Satanism. It's all about the individual. It's all about the ego. It's all about survival. That's why they're so terrified of death themselves. They participate in this cremation of care ceremony, and this they feel, and it looks like they, it gives them power. It gives them power to go on. So without this flesh, without this death, they're dead in the water. And what, what a gift we have with Ella, Ella's two children. They've, they were brave enough to come forward. They broke their uh, oath to their, their father on fear of punishment. In these death cults, they punish all the time. It's a trauma-based thing. You know, we've talked about trauma-based mind control in this program before. It's a trauma-based program. And I want to say this up front before we get into this any deeper. In this death cult thing that has the grips of mankind now, in this death cult thing, there are no winners. Everybody's a loser. Everybody's a victim. And I want to focus in on Ricky Dearman himself. Now, Ricky Dearman... If what the kids say is true, and there's been not only their testimony, but there's been research done by uh, Hempstead Research and a lot of other organizations that you can find on the internet that backs up what the, what the kids are saying. Actually, they're finding implications and, and 
direct links between the perpetrators of this crime and child trafficking and money and, and now high-ranking officials in the UK government that we may or may not get into uh, at this podcast. What's ha what happens is, if, if, if this is true, and I believe it is, Ricky is as much of a victim as Ella and the children are because he's a multi-generational uh, cult member. And what they do with the kids is they make them into, they cremate their care. What they do is they take away the essence of their humanness, which is love, caring, compassion, feeling, and they wash that away. They wash that away through trauma-based experiences, uh, having to commit murder in this particular cult, uh, drinking the blood of, of infants in this particular cult, and, and all the other cults, I would imagine, too. You become so you're not, you're not empathetic. I remember reading something a while back about how they trained a professional assassin. And this could be true with the CIA or the mafia or whoever the assassin works for. They start them off by, well, they give them a puppy or something and they can grow attached to the puppy. Then they kill the puppy in front of them. And then they give them another small animal. And then they have the child kill that small animal. Then they have the child kill other children. And it gets to be so that they don't care. They have, they're feelingless. I personally think that video games do the same thing. TV does the same thing. But this is a this is like a ritual cult that victimizes everybody. And it makes everybody in to what psychology would call psychopaths. These are people without feelings. People that are devoid of any compassion. People that don't relate to other people who care and love. Uh, I've, I've, I've read instances where psychopaths growing up in a family... Now, these people are born to be psychopaths. Some people are born, you can be born or you can be made a psychopath. Um, the psychopath really doesn't understand the feelings that their siblings are having. And so, not to be left out, not to be different, they ape the feelings that these people have. Now, this makes up for their lack, and actually it gives them a strength because they can without being hampered by feeling or caring, they can come forward and be whatever they want. So a person, let's say Ricky, uh, is a psychopath. And if, if he is involved, he's definitely a psychopath. And he's acting like a psychopath. A psychopath can custom make themselves to be what any, anything they want. This is why they make great actors. And I'd have to say that Ricky's an exception in that case after seeing his performance on BBC. But... It makes a lot of them great actors because they can be whatever you want. So he runs, he, he comes across uh, Ella and uh, possibly with the help of someone else and custom makes himself into whatever Ella wants. Does she want somebody who's dashing and eloquent? Well, he can do that. Does, he want, does she want somebody that's caring? Does she want somebody that's interested in health like she is? He can be whatever she wants. That's what psychopaths do. And, and you people out there, uh, uh, four in a hundred or one in a hundred, somewhere in there, are psychopaths. And so there's probably many of you who have run-ins with psychopaths who might work with them, who, who might have been involved, unfortunately involved in a relationship with them. Well, when they get into a relationship, when they get into a position of power, when they get into a position of power, what they do is they destroy. It's a, they're a member of a death cult. They destroy. They, they have what they, call, what they call envy. And this is different than jealousy. Jealousy is simply a feeling that, oh, man, I'd like to have a nice car like my neighbor. Or, oh, man, what a beautiful wife he has. Boy, I wish I was lucky enough like that. That's jealousy. It's not a good emotion to begin with. But envy's worse. Envy is, oh, that car next to me, he's no better than me. He shouldn't have that car. I'm going to destroy that car 
and I'm going to destroy him. And you can look at that when you look at the psychopaths in government. Look at the psychopaths in the American government. You've got Barack Obama. He's done everything he could to destroy the Constitution. He's done everything he could to destroy the economy. Huh. Well, look, you could go to UK right there. You've got David Cameron and uh, the guy who was involved in the uh, uh, Iraq War, Tony Blair. Tony Blair. The psychopaths. So you have a nice country. It's going along quite swimmingly. You destroy it. You destroy Iraq. You destroy everything. You destroy everything. That's how they work. So that's what's happening right now. Uh, and, it's, and that kind of activity is being protected. It's being protected by, in this case, Child Protective Services, the police department that refuses to investigate this, and also the judiciary system, which refuses to investigate and find out about it because it would implicate them. That's why. So let's go on and meet our guests. The first one we're going to have up, although you did hear from Abraham before in his comment about my choking. He's a delightful guy. You'll love him. And one of the most amazing people that I've ever met is Ella Draper. Now, Ella Draper is uh, a yoga teacher. She's gorgeous. She's so gorgeous. She's a, she's a beauty consultant. Uh, she's her own advertisement. But that's not what makes her special. What makes her special is her intelligence. She's very sharp. And also her strength. She's been able to weather this and she's coming forward um, and being very proactive in this. So before any further ado, let me introduce you to uh, one of our favorite people now, Ella Draper. Hello, uh, Mindy and Paul, and um, we're very happy um, to be invited to your show, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. And um, before uh, we start, uh, we would like to uh, say a few words about, um, to, to update uh, people who are listening to us uh, about what's going on right now, um, well, specifically in the UK. And um, there are a few, a lot of things happen today. Um, like, for example, uh, my parents um, flew to London a couple of days ago, and apparently they've been tricked by um, social services, saying that yeah, come to come, uh, come for a contact, and then um, but they did, they did mention that they wanted them for interview, and this interview was all about um, going through uh, Judge Puffley's uh, judgment. And they want them to agree with her judgment, basically to to put dirt over over their own daughter. And uh, this is an exchange for the contact, which we don't know whether we're even going to receive it. Contact, explain for the audience. Uh, the contact on contact with the children, who neither my parents nor me nor my elder son um, seen for uh, four months without uh, any explanations why they didn't give us contacts and uh, initially it was suspended the contacts were suspended following the release of the videos of course but this has been ages ago and uh, my parents have been sitting in, and waiting in london for many months for this uh, contest which never happened and then now they flew them all the way from uh, from russia you know it's, it's, a, it's quite a complicated flight and then um, to find out, uh, they, they found out that uh, they actually been tricked mm -hmm. and they had been black, blackmailed and bullied into um, <clears throat> into um, uh, signing these um, accusations against me. And of course, we know what's going to happen. <laughs> you know, for example, if they were uh, not, you know, they would, they would do that. For, for, first of all, they would not do that. But assuming they would have done it. There would be this is bill would be uh, uh, a sentence with a uh, signed sentence um, not to ever see children again, obviously, and that's what their agenda is. And um, um, before uh, in 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 proceedings, my parents were kind of like next um, next in line as um, um, as a guardians for children, and now of course after Parkley's uh, judgment. 
they now uh, they, they said it in, in the in this uh, interview with them uh, was yesterday that the first in line is actually the father they're going to be considering giving ch children to the father number one then retain children with the uk government and only afterwards they, can, they will consider my parents as guardians so things have been changed and um, it looks like they feel quite um confident mm -hmm. In, uh, in covering this up, they think that public is foolish, actually, and uh, no, not going to stand for that. Um, uh, so this is the situation. And uh, meanwhile, we also received a few more pieces of information. Uh, one of them was uh, from um, another mother in similar position, uh, Vicky Haig, and uh, I'm sure many, m many of um, uh, British people heard about her because she was also um, her son, um, her son been. she was accused publicly for uh, oh, she for um, for maybe I don't remember what exactly uh, yeah for coaching for coaching or falsely for, for falsely accusing a husband in, or ex-husband saying that he was uh, well, he was uh, he was raping uh, her daughter now she ended up losing her daughter in his favor the court um, allocated the child um, with the father and uh, she's been given a one year uh, sentence um, so she's a she, prison sentence for talking to her daughter in public Accidentally, I mean, they, they it looked like it was accidentally. they they met accidentally, and she started to speak to her daughter. So for that, she's been sent to prison for a year, and then she ended up run away from uh, <clears throat> uh, from uh, you know well from British establishments, uh, and, um, and now here. she's now she's she's been approached uh, she's been approached uh, by uh, Daily Mail to give an interview in connection with another case. Um, Rebecca Minnock, a young girl called Rebecca Minnock. She's just, she's, um, she's in hiding. Is Abraham us. as well? Sorry, she's in. Rebecca Minnock is in hiding with her three-year-old son, who has been um, given to a judge has made uh, made an order for her three-year-old son to be given handed to the abusive, the sexually abusive partner, allegedly sexually abusive partner, and. This young girl, Rebecca Minnick, is in hiding. It's um, it's high, it's uh, it's um, it's all over the UK media right now. The story, uh, because the parents have been threatened. No, her with, family been harassed. Her, fa her parents, her family have been have been threatened by the judge. They've been arrested and threatened with um, charges of um, perverting the course of justice which, and perjury, which carry quite quite um quite high sentences and uh, vicky haig has been asked well, to, mean to to give her whereabouts right yes to expect to reveal her whereabouts so unless they reveal her whereabouts they, they'll, they'll be charged with perverting the cause of justice and possibly perjury if they lie about it and um Vic, vicky haig the other mother who's who's living in france mm -hmm. is an ex vicky haig who's in france has been asked to comment on this asked to, for, for an interview with her with uh, daily mail however at the same time, this is all going on. Ella's parents are in the UK talking to Russian Embassy and MI5 operatives and social, social services, whilst something else is going on. Right, and all of this activity, and we have, Ella's received also an email this morning from the BBC asking her to reconsider giving an interview to them. And there are people tunneling and they have discovered a connection between the Hampstead case, alleged abuser, alleged abuser Galina Upson, boiler room money laundering operations in the Finchley Road, which happens to be in Hampstead, and a connection with a QC, a Queen's Council, namely Alex Cameron, who just happens to be the brother of the current Prime Minister, David Cameron. So, if anyone's wondering why there is this flurry of activity around these child abuse cases, I would ask them to go to Norwich Crown Court, where there is a trial in progress as we speak, where 10 allegedly professional 
six of them women, four men, are on trial for sexually abusing a group of children and forcing them to drink human blood. However, in this case, we feel, from our, from our investigation, we feel that the authorities' intention is to defame the, the decent social worker that may appear to be an oxymoron to some people, but there are decent, many decent social workers, and the intention of the authorities in this particular case, in the Norwich case, we feel is to, is to defame the social worker. Hence the sort of lack of um, mainstream media coverage in this case. So there's lots going on at this particular moment in time, and we just thought we'd bring you up to date before we before we shared. Well, that's really that's really important information, and thank you very much. In case you were wondering, um, the other voice that was chiming in there—that's our friend Abraham, Abraham Christie. He's Alice's partner, and they're. They're weathering this storm together. So he chimed in to uh, give you some details. Uh, let's, <clears throat> this is, good. And this is, Christie is the one who naively or otherwise revealed the children's, or discovered the children's, um, the children's dilemma and exposed it. So. Right. Just so, to, to know why you know who I am and my you know in context, put me into some form of context, as it were. Right. He was the one who got the children's confidence, and um, they trusted him and him and the mother enough to come forward on this uh, earth-shattering, um, could be uh, what do we call it, seismic shifting event that could really change everything. Um, paradigm shifting, paradigm shifting event. That's it, Paul. Yeah. Let's hope that. Let's hope that it is. Yeah. Um, right, and and what you've just described to us is is really brings home how pervasive this is. This is not an isolated incident just happening to you and your family, but it's going on all over the place, and it's really coming to the forefront now. Right, the MI5, the, the CIA, and all of them are scrambling for cover now. What are we going to do that's all coming out, and we're finding more and more of these cases. So let's hope that uh, the audience can spread this around, get this information out to everybody, because this is the information. You know, everybody's wanting to find out what we can do about this situation in the world. What can, we, what can we do about these endless wars? What can we do about being nailed down by these treaties and our, our, our freedoms uh, being taken away? We're being enslaved by a death cult. And by exposing this death cult, we can um, hopefully stop this thing, stop this activity, get these kids home again, and go back to, I'd say normal, but I think we're going to be much better off than normal when this whole thing stops. We'll have to go forward to a new way, Paul. Right. Going back, well, I don't think there is any going back. There is no going back. we we'll have to go forward to a new way. Exactly. Things have to change definitely, definitely is just uh, too much of the uh, things that, uh, that, that that's going on which shouldn't be happening. And what's going on with children is just... Um, just uh, no, no normal human being can can accept it. That's right. Not, not possible. This is a you know there's a there's a there's a there's a collective consciousness awakening, and people are you know people are no longer willing to accept these outdated ideas, these old traditions, like death being inevitable or necessary. So we're in a new you know we're, we're you know we're living interesting times. We certainly are, and, and I think a lot of people are in denial. But if they, if they can know you like we know you, and if they can hear what you're going through, and seeing it, seeing it, seeing this whole situation through your eyes, and now we're finding that it's it's breaking out all over. There's cases in France. There's faces in there's cases in Northern Europe. I mean, it's it's happening all over. So let's hope that. Uh, if we can, if we can just be aware of it, you know, my notion is that no decent person, and I mean by a decent person, I just mean a normal human being that cares and loves and feels compassionate for people who are suffering. 
no normal person can know this is going on and just turn their back on it. You can't deny it. You have to wake up. You have to wake everybody else around you up. And my notion is if, if half the British public uh, knew what we know just right here on World Beyond Belief and what we're, what we're talking about during this interview, um, I think it would change everything. So, you're totally right, Paul. You're totally yeah, right. They, they, yeah. we're, every day we're receiving, we're getting help from all over the world. Even yesterday, for example, we received an email. We don't know the fellow, a young fellow called Joachim. Joachim Bang Larsen. Where is he from? Where is he from? I'm from Norway. Yeah, and he uh, sent us a gift. He sent us a gift. Yeah, it's, uh, this, they send us, the, they've been working for several months to transcribe all, all the children's videos and police videos, which is a lot of material. And it looks like it's a group of them, uh, those young uh, people. And they've been, they just, they just uh, done this enormous amount of work transcri of transcribing all this, um, work, all yeah. this footage. And they just send it like this to us um, as a, gift, as a yeah. gift, which is amazing. And we're getting. And we would like to thank uh, to thank all, all of our supporters and people who come coming from all over the world, um, offering their help and um, and doing incredible work uh, like um, plenty. There's a forensic linguist who's done the analysis of children's um, interview, yeah, uh, a retraction yeah. interview. There is another American guy who's done a very thorough detail of. Uh, of um, uh, Diamond's uh, interview with the police on with the, the police on the fifteenth of September, and uh, showing how all of it was just a fabrication and just cover, and you know he, they, they never they never had attention to um, to arrest him or to charge him, obviously. So it's a, uh, people are uh, a lot of people are already awakened and um, uh, working hard to um, expose this um, horrendous crimes and. Um, I'm sure we're going to wake more people. And the evidence, the evidence, yeah, the evidence um, supporting the children's allegations now is overwhelming. And we feel the authorities are just beginning to realize the extent of the, the problem they have. However, before they've adequately dealt with it, they've been inundated with various other cases from, from you know, other sources, and they really got their hands full. They're in a bit of a pickle. Right. This is an unexpected occurrence. They didn't expect this to leak out. They didn't expect uh, those two brave children to come forward and blow their cover. Now they're scrambling the CIA, probably Mossad's involved, who knows, MI6. You know, they're all, they're all in place. Their whole purpose is to protect this, uh, this ruling elite. So... Uh they're, and, they're, and they're participating too, by the way. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. The evidence of them are participating uh, okay. a, lot, a lot of information about this. So it's a big job for us humans, but we really have to face up to this. We can't be in denial anymore. We, and we have to get, um, get going on this. Are there any mm -hmm. other updates that you want to bring us up to before we start talking about the actual uh, the case from your perspective? Oh, still no, I think we, I think we can go ahead with um, with the questions uh, that um, you would like to ask us, um, and I'm, I'm sure if something will will come up, uh, there's so much information. I'm sure we, we we're gonna slip in it here and there. Right. Well, we you can come back anytime. We can do a world beyond belief every week with okay. Abraham and Ella. Okay. That's fine with me. Nice. Uh, so. Why don't we start off uh, with a description from your standpoint, uh, Ella. What happened? How did you get involved with this, uh, this cult? Um, and um, kind of follow us, follow us through in the early years and then, uh, and then bring us to uh, today. And uh, Abraham, I didn't introduce you. This is Abraham Christie, and this guy is pretty amazing. He, um, I, I've been so impressed with him. He's incredibly sensitive. He's incredibly intuitive. He's the one, he was an objective observer when first noticing these children um, touching one another inappropriately. 
and he has an incredible amount of street smarts. So he was able to discern what was going on, plus his caring for these kids and the, the mother was able to bring them forward to disclose this information. These kids um, were very, very brave for coming forward and it really took a, uh, 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 Ella and, and Abraham were, are amazing in their ability to get them to come forward because of course these kids are threatened all the time. You know, in a, in a death call like this, uh, trauma is the rule. Uh, certainly they get sweets and certainly get money, but traumatic experiences is what causes them to fragment their personalities and become uh, subservient to the will of the, of the cult. So they were certainly, they were certainly threatened uh, by consequences uh, when they came forward. But because of this amazing man and, his, and uh, Ella, they were able to come forward and, uh, and ironically, I have, to, I have to say this up front, ironically, what um, Abraham is working on is um, a kind of a, bl a blood cleanser made from <laughs> plant medicine that uh, that blood that, 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 that could indeed cure people who might be in these cults. I, I know that's an amazing coincidence, but also if you've listened to World Bomb Beyond Belief, you know we don't do coincidences. We do synchronicities. So it's amazing synchronicity that this amazing man was brought to, to Ella at this time and the kids and brought to us. And he just happens to be, oh, funny, funny thing, working with something that might be the path out of this for many people trapped in these satanic cults. But anyway, I, I, I digress. Let's get back to the, the story and Ella can bring us up to date on on just a happen, happenstance, so people can identify with what you've been through, Ella. Okay, thank you. Well, um, I would like to start uh, by explaining that um, uh, Ricky Demon, um, he is a generational uh, pedophile and most likely a um, follower of the cult. Um, uh, because as children are uh, alleged, um, his mother and uh, his brother and sister with their spouses, the grandmother um, are also um, uh, 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 okay, uh, were commit well, still are committing this, um, uh, these practices, child sacrifices, and um, also um, looks like his father was uh, also part of it. And um, he was quite a, uh, as I understand, he passed away. And um, he was uh, quite, um, he was a sadistic uh, person. He was uh, beating children uh, quite badly. Like he was, ex he was, um, he mentioned black and blue. And um, uh, he was indulging himself in alcohol, but um, the, <clears throat> uh, the treatment of those children uh, received was, uh, was horrendous. And um, so uh, I understand that um, yeah, uh, so I would, I would, I would, I would go, um, I would go back um, um, in time and um, explain a little bit how I met him and um, and in fact, I would, I wanted to go a little bit further before that. Uh, since the whole the the the, um, the meeting uh, the, this uh, the way we met, it it seems to be it's been set up uh, by uh, my previous uh, husband uh, who I've been legally married to and who I had a child with, and as children explained, um, they knew each other from before before even I met uh, Mr. Dearman, and. Um, uh, his name is Draper, Will Draper, who uh, went to Russia uh, to work for a financial consultancy uh, company, uh, worked for a few Russian oligarchs, and um, 
the idea was to come and um, uh, get a Russian wife. Um, and I understand this been going on for quite a while uh, that um, uh, English, English British men, um, perhaps a lot of them pedophiles, were going to Eastern Europe as well as Russia to marry Russian women. And um, you know, so it's it, it that um, and brought them to the UK, and then ha we would have children with them and uh, and. Um, if uh, mothers would protest or, found, uh, or find out about uh, what they've been doing with children, uh, they would have been either put to jail or hounded out of the country. Um, but a lot of these women, I would, I would imagine, uh, don't have or didn't ha don't have clue or didn't have clue about what's going on, like I didn't. Um, simply because our background background is entirely different um, uh, from the people who've been uh, born in Britain, for example, uh, we 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 hardly hear about pedophilia, about this kind of uh, criminal activity, or about those cults. I'm sure that nowadays is happening as well, and we are we getting um, some disturbing reports from Russia as well. Um, surrounding orphanages and uh, children being snatched as well from from their parents who um, have, for example, lower than supposed uh, well, uh, lower than um, <clears throat> than agreed uh, level of income, for example, that that this will be the trigger for authority to take children, and this is this is already happening, uh, to my understanding. So. Um, so yes, uh, so children did mention um, uh, Mr. Draper on few occasions as a member of cult who is uh, who's been participating in uh, orgies um, with his whole uh, with his whole family. Um, on one hand, of course, it's very difficult for me to believe that, and uh, part of me does not want to believe it, uh, to believe it because that means that my eldest son, perhaps been also abused uh, by his father and uh, but then I'm sure we're gonna find out uh, I can't say that for 100 uh, 100 percent of course um, but I'm sure the time will show will will reveal this the truth about what's going on then and any, anyhow I was um, uh, since uh, 2000, 2000, I was um, I started to actively uh, teach yoga, um, and um, Mr. Diamond showed up on one of my uh, classes, and um, he then approached me about a private session, private yoga session, which I agreed to, and at that time he, um, he invited me out a few times, and uh, but intuitively I I just um, I, I just felt something, something, something weird about him, and uh, so I declined declined his attention after a few dates. Uh, so later on, he um, again showed up in my life, and yeah, um, yeah. Uh, a year later, almost, where I was working on um, on yoga retreat, and um, at the time I wasn't wasn't very confident with computers. So he offered me his help, claiming to be a photographer. And I thought, all right, you know, um, maybe that uh, that would be helpful and useful. And somehow I would, uh, I, I put my guard down, and um, um, I, I, I was also um, charmed by um, um, by his presentation to me. I mean. A, he, he seemed to be fitting many of the, um, how to say, my um, requirements um, about the partner. For example, I was, I was seeking for spirituality at the time, um, so he introduced me to in, uh, into meditation, which I, I'm still meditating until now. And this actually is, 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 is really strange because he's the one who... Um, Introduced meditation to me, and um, meditation actually helped me to survive through the time of being with uh, through this relationship because that relationship was um, 
um, I would say, super stressful and exhausting and depleting. And um, imagine I had two ch children, one after another. So I was like full-time mother looking after two children, which is just one year, 14 months apart. And on top of it, I, I was under immense pressure by him, uh, you know, psychological. He's, um, um, it just, um, it's a psychological warfare. It's uh, the term actually been 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 men, uh, be, been uh, put to us by one of our friends in regards to the children. But this is the best term to be uh, to to describe um, that relationship. It was a psychological warfare, and um, and very soon um, after um, after even I think before before during pregnancy. Before even um, my daughter was born, I realized that um, there was something that that my first into um, uh, my first um, perception and my intuition was uh, was right. Were right. Um, there is something not quite right about this person, and so we we um, we separated soon after Gabriel was born. But it was a lot of a lot of things happened during this time, and of course he wouldn't leave me alone even afterwards. He kept bring, he kept uh, coming to my house, breaking through the garden door and stalking us and uh, sending me all kind of uh, harassing emails, sexually, sexually harassing emails, uh, which I already was I already was aware about um, his um, um, sexual perversion uh, because of his. Um, uh, the pressure he put on me um, to um, perform uh, anal sex with him, for example, um, his gifts in, in the shape of uh, enormous dildo that he, he brought to my house and I, I threw it uh, right after, or things like, um, uh, what else was there? Um, he he kept he he kept um, he kept insisting of me watching porn with him online and um, and if, even afterwards if they, uh, even after we separated he he kept sending me emails uh, with links to go to porn porn sites which I never kind of I never engaged in, in, in into it I was not interested. Um, yeah, but I mean, this is kind of in brief um, the um, a little background, if you wish. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I know that's that's difficult to 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 reexamine what what happened, and I talked a little bit in the beginning of this about um, uh, psychopaths, and um, if if Ricky uh, is damaged the way we suspect that he was damaged, then he's probably. Um, you know, turned out to have these psychopathic behaviors where you could, where you seduce someone, you get in a relationship, and then you have to destroy everything in sight, including the, 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 the wife, the children, and so on. So, okay. so uh, there were some troubled times with, uh, with a custody battle down through the years? Uh, there was. Um, uh, well, uh, about uh, there were no battle um, over the custody, but there were um, uh, there was an uh, ongoing battle of the contacts uh, with children, and in the beginning when children were um, uh, very young, um, maybe up to I would say three four years old, I didn't object the contacts too much. Um, children seemed to be um, um, fine with him. Although I was a little bit concerned about certain aspects as, aspects of um, uh, of his behavior with children, but there was no not, nothing dramatic or nothing too obvious which um, um, developed too much of suspicions uh, in me. However, uh, during um, after a little while, um, things started to to, to uh, really concern me. For example. Uh, children started to tantrum a lot and inappropriate for their age. I mean, like three, four, five years old. I mean, children suppo supposed to be growing out a little bit out of tantrums and kind of asser asserting their sort of self um, independence, right? But um, 
for example, Gabriel, um, when we, it, it, with Gabriel, it would always happen before, oh, uh, just, just at front of my ho home, he would, he would refuse to go in the house. And he would lie down on the pavement, kick his feet, and it would be like a quite quite a um, um, a scene. And it would take maybe 15, 20 minutes just to calm him down. And still, he would be quite reluctant to go inside the house. And Alisa also would would um, would throw terrible um, scenes, like kicking the fridge, and is and it's, um, and it would be. Um, and they would not say why. They would not. It, it seemed like there were no um, apparent, apparent reasons for them to behave this way, and their aggression towards uh, towards me, to, uh, towards each other, was growing as well. And then um, I started to notice that um, after seeing uh, after seeing him, they would come. They would come in very distorted state, in uh, aggressive, in. Um, Unreasonable. I mean, they would, it would not quite be possible to reason with them. They would be. They just were, were going crazy, and um, um, and I was blaming uh, this on food because I'm quite a health conscious person. Um, uh, I, I've been vegan. Which, I mean, children. Children. Children been uh, brought out vegetarian uh, and then later on vegan. So, to my to my knowledge, they 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 never they never touched me. But uh, now we know they did actually, and uh, Dad was uh, promoting that as well heavily on them. Um, and I would imagine that's why they were they were getting really um, disgusted when, for example, we would walk through the aisles with meat in uh -huh. super aisles of meat um, in supermarkets, for example. Um, so. And then the um, and then after um, after this uh, after the series of violence against me against my son against my mom then uh, this is when I applied for mm, uh, for the emergency uh, injunction order against him which prevented him to come uh, near my house which I then uh, continued and then as, as a response he also filed some application for prohibited steps, steps saying that I'm trying to get children out of the country and uh, a lot of lies and um, and this is how it started um, but what I experienced is that during these four years um, uh, judicial system were um, supporting him and in spite of the violence in spite of many um, dramatic incidents like leaving children on the busy junction uh, of, um, of the high of the motorway um, uh, children were left on the high fence on their own for half an hour while he went to have a coffee in the cafeteria um, as a punishment for because children did refuse to talk to him the day before and he said, "Oh, now, um, now I'm busy. Now I'm going, and I don't want to speak to you, or something like that." And on the other occasion, he kept children uh, at their unknown address um, for three days. And anyhow, regardless of all this, uh, I found that court still were giving him contacts, um, disregarded any risks presented to the children. And um, for a whole year, between 2010 and 2011, uh, children been seeing him every Saturday for um, uh, well, from 10 to 6, so almost all day. And this is where, and this is when all this um, swimming, uh, swimming bath visits happened. And um, uh, this is when uh, he started to take uh, to take children uh, to the first pedophile uh, ring which uh, children I uh, um, talking about and this is not I'm not talking about this cult which is um, children alleging uh, uh, just alleged recently right right it's something so I'm talking about there was a uh, this uh, pedophile cult, uh, pedophile ring uh, consisted of um, um, uh, a handful of uh, members um, of different nationalities and who were uh, raping children abusing them, um, being violent to them, uh, treated them really badly. Is This is one time that children saying that they tried to run away. 
but of course they didn't go too far they won only were like four and five years old this is preschool years we're talking about and this is where um, our father's uh, family also been participating in this activity in this orgies uh, the were the filming um, uh, movies of um, of um, um, well child pornography movies you know the, those those acts that they've been performing on children and um, uh, also snuff movies uh, children are very um, um, how to say um, uh, very colorfully. Um, Explaining how um, they, they they they've been filmed uh, when their mouth been um, sort of cl um, um, closed and um, they've been forced to see other children being raped as well. Mm -hmm. And um, jo uh, like Gabriel showed me that uh, one of the men will hold his head uh, to make sure he doesn't turn away when uh, and uh, so the, to make sure he watched like his uh, when his sister or other children been raped them because those couples um uh demons uh brother and sister with their spouses and both couples um have two children they also brought those brought, brought, brought those children for rape as well as other members um, of this um, pedophile cult and this is i i understand his career as a child pornographer and snuff and snuff movie producer took off and um and of course uh <laughs> moreover he's uh, he's been using my money to do that under pretense of developing internet marketing business so you're but, talking about ricky having uh, having this business that's correct that's correct that's correct and now we have evidences of um, of um, um, uh, certain uh, child pornography uh, websites being being connected to to his IP IP address, and in fact, um, one of the advertisements on his uh, sites uh, featuring uh, my daughter, mm -hmm. and uh, and of course, uh, her name is not a um, a common name in England. It's actually a Russian version of Alice. Uh, like Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. So there is very, very. I mean, I, I, I have never heard uh, this name before. Abraham, who grew up, uh, who grew up in England, he never heard about uh, this name before. So it's quite specific. The spelling is quite specific, right? And, yeah. Um, and he's stating exactly her age, um, and saying that she's ready for for the act. And of course, it's um, it's been quite disheartening. To, to, to learn about it, that he's, uh, he's been advertising his own daughter on his um, pornography, pornography sites. Wow. Um, yeah. this, is, this is devastating. I mean, this is, this is difficult to witness. I mean, I advocate with witnessing. I think that that's what we're all here to do, see what's going on and fix it. And I'm having, I'm having trouble getting through this. Uh, interview myself. That's it's yeah. it's incredible. There are a lot of heavy details there, of course, and um, uh, the worm. Um, is mm -mm. since his children disclosed um, what, what um, the experiences. Um, many many people um, ask about how how I did not see, but I will repartly answer this question that because of my background and um, my what the lack of experience um, in regards to those things however I knew that um, that uh, there was something dramatically wrong with my children um, you know this aggression you know first of all um, children we, we don't have we don't have television at home also we do have television set but it's it's never been connected to the um, aerial for example so we do not watch i have not watched television for maybe 30 years now um and um uh, so children don't have access to the television too i mean they would watch i would um, i would uh, i would put maybe educational uh, uh, like um, david attenborough uh, series for example about the planet, about animals, and the development of the species uh, is rather fascinating. Um, or certain films, 
uh, both in Russian and English. So, um, uh, and kind of like more of an interesting sort of good more, uh, you know, high morals content. And also they never had um, um, access to the inter internet either. Um, uh, my, all my, all my um, equipment is, uh, is password protected. Um, they never, they never went on the internet by themselves. So contrary to what uh, social services now uh, alleging that children took this information from certain films also from internet is just um, it's um, it cannot be, be further from the truth because simply children were not exposed to this kind of, well to to internet at all and um, also but what I was what I was going to mention that. Um, there were a lot of a lot of warning signs, a lot of concerning signs in children's um, behavior, like the aggression, um, the um, the extreme violence uh, uh, towards each other, and um, and also about a year and a half before this uh, incident, um, I caught children in the bathroom uh, doing something strange. Um, Alisa had her panties off and Gabriel was filming her. Um, it's only um, 50 seconds of the footage, but that was quite concerning. However, this, the, uh, the fact that they were filming this, that um, uh, was quite uh, concerning to me, uh, where they copied this behavior, where they saw this kind of behavior. And of course, I was um, I was uh, I was on guard since then, and um, uh, but I never I never caught them red-handed. Although although I was suspicious about um, them perhaps doing something behind my back. Um, but again, we've spoken about the science language, for example, that uh, children were um, uh, communicating uh, with each other with and uh, of course um, you know being a single mother with with, with uh, two uh, quite unruly children it was a challenge on its own and I you know I was doing my best educating them and so I was like really really busy uh, always as you can imagine um, so it was it was not easy to to always keep an eye on them and also their father um, as children saying now um, told them to make it difficult for me, so they would, on purpose, um, they would, they would say they're always hungry, so they would keep me in the kitchen a lot of the times, and um, while they would probably sneak away and uh, touch each other, as um, as the father, as their father ordered them to do five times a day, and not just that, um, how children describing it, for example. Um, he would ask them, oh, did you touch each other five times a day? And if they would say yes, then he would still punish them severely by hitting them and um, punishing them physically quite badly. And, um, and this is another, another kind of side of, uh, of the story as well. They, this, these abusers, these rapists, the sodomites, they were extremely violent to the children. Um, uh, kicking children in their front privates, and um, on one occasion, their dad he hit Gabriel so hard on his ear that his ear was bleeding. And believe it or not, later on, since children been taken away, they are saying now that it was Abraham who hit them. Uh, so Gabriel's ear was bleeding, even though Abraham only knew children for three months, and I was there all the time. And you spoke to Dr. Holmes. And I also spoke uh, spoken to Dr. Holtz, who provided the medical examination, and she did confirm that it was an old injury, where, of course, social services twisted it around and said, it, oh, no, this is just happened, you know, this is a happened. Right. Uh, Abraham is abused, and, uh, he was, uh, and there was horrendous details that they came up with, saying that he was pushing them against the walls, um, uh, torturing them, and... Um, uh, all kind of unimaginable things, and um, it's part of the cover -up. Uh, but it's a, obviously it's a part of the cover up. They had to blame someone. Right, but they're they're blaming you. They're blaming Abraham. Without, I mean, you have to have some testimony. You have to have some evidence, and all the evidence points to the fact that they were sexually abused 
over a long period of time. Um, exactly. And it, it really it has nothing to do with, with Abraham, who's a relatively latecomer in this whole scenario. I hope that the people that are listening to The World Beyond Belief are thinking about their own situations and situations of their neighbors and their relatives. Are these uh, symptoms popping up? Are you seeing um, these aberrant behaviors occurring in your children? Because this is not an isolated incident. This is a very, very common um, activity in the world today because this is a power source for the, yeah. the controlling body. So this is very common. And because there's a consciousness awakening happening on the planet, and to try to circumvent this, this incredible awakening that we're all having, they need more and more power. So they need to consume more and more children, more and more st- snuff films, more and more babies. Uh, this is... More and more abortions, more and more food cells in the food supply. Exactly. And while you're on there, uh, would you like to, uh, Abraham, would you like to uh, add anything to what uh, Ella's been saying? I mean, from your, your perspective? Well, a couple of points came up. There is, a, there is, there is another girl called um, Elisa. Apparently her body was found in the grounds of the royal family. I'm not sure if it's Balmoral or something, but one of, those, one of their estates, the body of a, of, of a Russian girl called Elisa was found in, the, in their ground. Uh, but uh, the, the main point is this, is that the children alleged that their father told them to make it difficult for their mother. And they told us this repeatedly, and we couldn't work out why, but we, as, we feel that the reason he told them to make it difficult was so that Ella would never put two and two together and work out what exactly was happening to the children. She'd be too busy. Like, for example, like, for example, why children's behavior deteriorated since he came back to London in 2013, even though formally he did not see them. But children's behavior started to uh, worsen a lot. And that's because, of course, he was coming to the school, right? Hmm. Right. And um, there is something else I just um, uh, realized uh, uh, it could be quite important. That when I was talking that when they tried to scapegoat Abraham and to blame him uh, uh, about, you know, with, with what happened, they never actually interviewed him even. So I've never been interviewed. Yeah, police have never interviewed me for ever. Wow. Paul has never interviewed me regarding this case. That's ever. that's totally that's totally amazing. And Ella, ne- Ella's interviewed, but somehow um, I don't know. We've never seen never been disclosed as well because I gave them I gave uh, um, maybe three hours of um, of interview to the police. Uh, we have a transcript, but uh, the uh, original recording actually uh, has never been disclosed. As well as, well as his uh, um, audio, his uh, interview was never, was never disclosed by the police, which is supposed to be, um, which is, was ordered by the court to disclose to make, to make the disclosure. You mean his? You mean uh, Ricky? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so. The there was a uh, there was a policeman that was interviewed on. Uh, we got it from YouTube and we put it on our inter- our uh, podcast one thirty five, where this I think he was a sergeant. He was an ex police sergeant. His name is Ray Savage. We've met him. Yes. He said that this woman is telling the truth. He he has an experience and actually there was a uh, there was a policeman right there. And he pointed to him and he said, it's your job to make sure that this thing is properly investigated. And of course, the, it pro- of course it wasn't. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so so um, as, we, as we continue on with this case, <clears throat> the children were given sign language that uh, Abraham discovered to communicate behind Ella's back. And also... Weren't you telling me that there was a plot to kill Ella? Yeah, he was also uh, ordering them to kill me for, they're saying, for two years. 
prior, um, prior this um, disclosure and um, children have been refusing to do that and um, I know that he's been putting pressure on them and then finally when um, um, then later when uh, we were together with Abraham he was telling them to do the same thing uh, to both of us or to one of us and of course that will this this is understandable why he would plot this uh well, <clears throat> why he would, uh, he okay. would do this <laughs> we feel that his his intention in asking the children to kill either of us was was to um, to achieve custody of the children uh if he had, if the children killed ella we feel that they would have implicated me i would have gone i would have been charged with that and ella would be dead and then he would have access to the children or if they'd have killed me he could have convinced them to kill me um then they would have implicated ella and um then most he, likely sent to the um, and then ella may prison be, house or something may, ella may have been sectioned and then he may have come along later on to to um blackmail ella into into joining the cult um which he, which, he, which he always wanted. That's right, because people, yeah, people aren't aware that he, um, it, 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 he lost face within the cult because he, he wasn't, he was unable to convince Ella to join, and that was always um, a slight for him. It was a slight on his. Um, I even, I even been approached by um, uh, certain cult members. Of course, at the time I didn't know they were um, involved. Uh, but uh, now I understand a few people asking me personal questions about him, which is they have no idea who is him. That he never, to my knowledge, came to the school even. How do? Why do they ask about this? Why? Uh, why do they ask? Why are they curious about it? Uh, and too, 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 too much, too much questions. Too, too, uh, too, too, you know, too much interest. So, but now it's kind of it makes sense um, why yeah. it has been going on. So they they were they were asking you to get involved with them, or they were they were just asking you about uh, Ricky. No, they were asking about him, about him, about um, the relationship <clears throat> with him, and ah. what happened, and why I'm not with him, and um, what kind of person he is. And I thought, oh, why are they so interested? You know, they never met the guy, and. Uh, but now I understand. I would imagine that many of them will be puzzled. Why? Uh, why I'm not there? Why I'm not part of the cult? Regarding his um, his insistence of the you know to the children to kill us, it may seem a bit uh, a bit. It may seem a bit too much. It might uh, be difficult for some people. Extreme, to, huh? yeah. It might be some people difficult for people to take on board. However, once they realise that the children have admitted to having partaken in the um, ritual sacrifice of 70 children each, so that's the number I remember. And then they gave a number of 140, so it seems as if Gabriel assisted their father in 70, and Elisa assisted him in 70 ritual sacrifices. And we suspect there may have even been more, but the, the degree of trauma and um, murder that they've been exposed to, we feel, desensitized the children to killing. And when we when we questioned Elisa, you know, um, Ella had already uh, realised we'd already felt felt that you know threatened. We already knew about it. They already yeah. disclosed this. They'd already disclosed that, that you know he'd been encouraging them to kill us. And when we asked Elisa, when Elisa, when Ella asked Elisa if she was still thinking about killing us, Elisa said yes, sometimes. And when we asked her how how she intended to to commit this. She, she told us she, quite graphically that she'd come and into the bedroom while we were sleeping and stab us in our hearts because obviously she knew she knew you know the location of the heart within the human organism in fact she asked me a couple of times where is your heart mom <laughs> oh my goodness yeah exactly where is your heart mom because she'd been um, she'd been disemboweling disemboweling infants mm. so she was you know she was in tune to she was aware was she and, uh, go um, ahead on Gabriel, one time, um, Elisa, because he is subordinate to Elisa within the cult, um, apart from loving her, apart from loving her blindly, and she she sent him to, to kill me while I was in bed one time, and he wouldn't do it. But event, what they did eventually 
They sent Gabriel to cut a lock of my hair at the front. I've still got a little patch from where he cut because I haven't grown back properly yet. And he, he duly did this. He came into the bedroom with a scissors during the night and he cut a lock of my hair. And we, they disclosed this to us. And we feel that this was in preparation to, um, to commit the, um, the, yeah. This sounds like this sounds like it's linked to voodoo, some kind of oh, a. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Oh, he got them. He, he he made the children steal my my phone, and the silver bracelet, a silver bracelet I have, um, like an amulet. It's a um, it's a South American Indian thing, um, and he, he he made them steal that. He made them steal some underwear. Apparently, he was dancing with my underwear and. Um, <laughs> I don't know what they believe. It's their belief system. It's their um, it's their belief system. They do some dark magic, but it appears that their dark magic is about to backfire upon them. So let's hope. Let's hope. It's all good. It's all it's all good. I I'm thinking now as we're going through this, the dilemma that these uh, children were in, especially Elisa. I know that she really uh, she cares for she has a she has a natural bond with her father like most daughters do, mm-hmm. and so she had some loyalty to him. And I can remember a a tape that you probably made on the uh, plane coming back from Morocco, of where uh, Gabriel was uh, pleading with Elisa to tell the truth to tell the truth. It was mm-hmm. pretty touching. Yeah, yeah. But, but this must have been really. This must be horrible for these kids. I can't even imagine. And and Ricky must have gone through this himself. I mean, he must, of course, he wasn't conflicted because he didn't have a person like Ella with high uh, high moral standards, which is pretty rare in the world. But her Sorry. ability... Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, Paul. Sorry, Paul. Thankfully, not that rare. Thankfully. Thankfully, yeah. Have high moral standards, yeah. Paul is saying that it's rare for people to have high moral standards. Well, it's, it's uh, we're 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 so happy to see that it's not that rare. You know, these people from amazing, beautiful people from all over the world coming, and they they see it as their mission to to put the stop to it. So this is indicates that you know we have a lot of good people there who are and they have number they have number who mean well and who. Who wants to change things for the better? Who want to uh, clean our planet from from this from this scourge? Uh, yeah, dirt. Yeah, right. Well, that's that's incredible. That's an incredible story, and I'm I'm glad that we got to uh, bring it out and fluff it out in in full details. Uh, mm-hmm. In in subsequent interviews, what we want to do is we want to pull in. Um, what Abraham now is doing with plant medicine and how that totally inter, inter, interfaces with the cult activity, how that could be our springboard to maybe um, allowing people to break free of these cults if, if, if it could ever happen. Um, Paul, yeah. you great. Some really, no, you have some really wonderful insights. That, you know, honestly, that we hadn't even, you know, thought of to the degree you have, and well, um, that we felt we selfish. felt that yes, we felt that same degree of high moral standards from you when you were doing your original your original podcast regarding the case, and this is what attracted us to you. This you still- this gets me. This, and Mindy can tell you from even before we started World Beyond Belief, this has got to stop. I can't imagine children being kidnapped and taken and ritually sacrificed, kept in, kept in dungeons, and it's happening all over the place. Or these, uh, these babies, I, I, I remember uh, listening to one of the Hempstead research uh, tapes about tracing where the babies came from, from the different countries in South America, and even in the United States, where these yeah. babies were flown into. It's got to stop. And I'm... Uh, totally dedicated to doing everything I can to do that and uh, it just has to stop and I think it's their I think it's their Achilles heel Abraham I think I think that this is you know if you want to do something about the state of the world 
stop this. That's stop what to the do. Child, the, child, the, the ritual child sacrifice, sacrifice and sodomy. Yeah. Exactly. It's got to be a good start. It's got to be a good Make start. Make sure the children are safe. Yeah. Yeah. It, exactly. Yeah, and they have their childhood. That's right. And they're happy. To this end, Paul, we are we're actively co-creating. We're co-creating environments where children. Children can. In some, one of our projects. This is one of our main projects where people can come at, and and recover from these from these sort of um, from these experiences yeah. and this traumatization that they've gone through. We actually are um, working on setting up a center um, with, with 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 natural um, garden center with the. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, the nutrition, the nutrition which um, helps those uh, those people to recover and to delete uh, the mind programming and, um, uh, and branches, which is also very rejuvenating on the um, on all kind of levels. Sorry, it's a spiritual you. nutrition really that um, we are working with. Yes, because Cassie O'Brien says it, and Paul Cassie O'Brien says categorically that. The reason that cannabis is frowned upon by these authorities and um, prohibited is because cannabis prevents and deletes the mind control programming. Exactly. So it might be the path out. Now, <clears throat> let me make this clear. We're not talking about smoking cannabis. We're not talking about getting high. We're talking about the nutritional benefit of the hemp plant. The hemp plant is is probably the most amazing plant on on the earth. It could solve all the problems. There's a there's a hemp plant in uh, Southeast Asia that grows 40 feet in one year. That would solve the energy crisis. Uh, Henry Ford actually uh, either said he could make one or made an entire automobile out of hemp and powered it with hemp. With hemp biofuels, that's correct. With hemp yes. biofuels, so it's so it's not so out of the realm of possibility that this amazing food that that uh, Abraham has been working with for years uh, could turn the tide, could release people from this mind control, satanic ritual abuse. It it could be the it could be the path out. It could be a fresh, so fresh, raw, fresh raw cannabis, the juice of fresh raw cannabis incorporating the leaves, the seeds and the flowers is an ideal plant-based blood transfusion liquid for humans and other mammals. As opposed, and as opposed to as opposed to drinking and consuming the blood of humans, of course, which precludes that. How, and we would direct people to www.cannabisinternational.org, which is the website of um, Dr. William Courtney, who's done sterling work in disseminating the information. He's also a psychologist as well as a medical doctor. He's done sterling work in disseminating the information regarding cannabis as an ideal raw plant food, as a vegetable. And we're, and we're working on, <clears throat> on the website as well with um, practical advices and um, we um, were planning to run, uh, to run live seminars educating people uh, on the subject and how to prepare and about the recipe, uh, recipes and um, all kind of ways to, um, <clears throat> to, um, to consume this amazing, this magical plant and to help uh, rejuvenate, to help um, to, increase, to, to heal, to increase the mental capacity, there's so many different aspects to this amazing plan. And to assist people to, um, as you say, Paul, to, to escape from these death cults and, right. to embrace, and to embrace a culture of life. That's, that's so wonderful. What we're going to do is we're going to attach Dr. Courtney's um, video at the end of this video. So if you just... Take a, taking 15 more minutes, you'll be able to catch up on the amazing thing that the amazing cures that they're undertaking using uh, hemp. And it's, it's, it's totally amazing. And I think it's um, not so coincidental that um, Abraham 
is in the middle of this research. He actually, he has uh, credentials that were given to him by, by uh, institutions. Dr. Go ahead, Dr. won't you? Dr. Annika Westra, it's, it's, it's an honorary doctorate conferred upon me by Dr. Annika Westra, who's a scientist, um, for, for my work in the field of um, um, plant-based blood transfusions. Oh, no, and specifically proteins of the blood, right? Yes, it was specifically um, by showing that the heme, the heme molecule and the um, chlorophyll molecule are identical. Our blood is made of two proteins, the heme, heme proteins and globular proteins. And the hemp plant is the ideal source of both types of protein. The chlorophyll-rich leaves and seed, leaves and flowers provide all the raw materials to create heme, because the chlorophyll molecule and the heme molecule are identical. Apart from the central atom in heme is magnesium. No, the central atom in heme, sorry, is iron. And the central atom in chlorophyll is magnesium. The magnesium making chlorophyll green and the iron making the heme red. And the ideal source of the globular proteins are the hemp seeds. So by drinking a, um, the blood of cannabis, as it were, you would have heme proteins and globular proteins creating hemoglobin, an ideal plant-based blood transfusion liquid for humans and mammals. And it doesn't, and it doesn't have any hallucinogenic no. qualities. Um, well, I'll tell you about the psychoactive, what the psychoactive <laughs> aspect. What happens is that um, the cannabis plant contains cannabinoids. Now, these cannabinoids, in their natural fresh form, they are, ca they are cannabinoid acids. And in the acid form, they are totally non-psychoactive. One has to consume two to three kilos of them in order to um, experience any psychoactivity. However, in, that's in their fresh in their fresh state. When these when these um, cannabinoids are dried, however, when they're dried or cooked, what happens is that they lose the acid chain. They lose the acid part of the molecule and become neutral molecules. They become can, neutral cannabinoids, and these are the cause. For example, um, THC neutral THC in 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 small doses can. Um, can have, people can experience overdoses of dried THC neutral. And this is what causes the unpleasant side effects like paranoia and, and heart palpitations. So cooked cannabis or dried cannabis is not, is not natural, even it's though it's, it's not the natural way to consume or to commune with the sacred, sacred plant. What we should we should have it as a as a raw food, as a fresh raw food, or we should drink the blood or the juice of this plant. And um, this is this is um, research that has been hindered due to prohibition. But thanks to the, thanks to people like Robert Courtney and others, the the information is, is being disseminated disseminated to the general populace now. And we feel that this is an integral part of the collective consciousness awakening. There is another, actually, while we're speaking in that uh, about the subject, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, there is another aspect of, um, of the healing effect of the plant, where um, cannabis plant is capable to um, repair DNA damaged uh, done by the um, pollution or unnatural lifestyle and or uh, genera generational lack or malnutrition if you will, and um, it appears that the male plant, the pollen of the male plant, contains pure DNA. And the plant helps us to repair any genetic mutation, any DNA mutation that's gone on. And then the raw materials allow us to rebuild human organism according to the now repaired genetic blueprint. Um, I trust I, I trust that's clear. Is that clear enough to you, Paul? Yeah, it is. It's it's fascinating, and it's it sounds like it sounds like the key to a lot of things are, are is through this hemp plant. Tell me um, a little bit more about. I know that blood drinking. You know the, the satanic uh, overlords or the 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 warp in the matrix or whatever you're going to call it. 
<laughs> that's that's taking over and trying to uh, thwart this awakening that's happening on the planet. They're they're making, uh, they, of course, they do blood drinking in their rituals, and they're making blood drinking a lot more of a. Uh, Attempting to normalize. They're attempting to normalize it. You can find performance artists who drink this on stage during their vocal performances. Uh, also, you were talking about uh, even a, a report came out from uh, Mike Adams about the I benefits of drinking drinking blood. Or yes, I don't know he was from. There's also no, that's another one. The BBC documentary was another one. Mike Adams did a recent. He did a recent um, expose on. On the um, attempted normalization of blood drinking, he wasn't he wasn't condoning it. He was just ex he was just revealing revealing the fact that they were attempting to normalize the consumption of blood due to some um, um, experiments that have been done on mice, injecting older mice with the blood of younger mice. Well, and and I think we've talked about this before, Abraham. Drinking blood is addictive, isn't it? Most definitely, it's definitely addictive due to. Um, uh, the, well, the, the mineral content, number one, would make it addictive. However, for these cults, they're, they're traumatizing. The because trauma of lack of nutrients in, in them. They, 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 uh -huh. They're craving blood because young blood contains um, more minerals. It's rich in minerals. Nutri nutrients, yes, yes. However, when they're, t when they're traumatizing these young children, the blood becomes um, adrenalized, as it were. becomes rich in the blood and organs become rich in, in adrenaline. And um, what what happens is that the adrenaline can break down into a into a compound, an oxidation compound, known as adrenochrome. Um, these very same cult members and their minions and their ilk, they attempt to perpetuate the myth that adrenochrome doesn't exist. However, there are many many references to adrenochrome throughout popular literature. Um, Aldous Huxley mentions adrenochrome in the doors of perception, as does Tom, uh, Hunter S. Thompson in um, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, um, and who else? Kubrick in um, A Clockwork Orange. Uh, written by who is Written it? by Graham Greene. Graham, Graham Greene, apparently, who um, has um, what we would call spook credentials as well, another, another um, intelligence. Operative Graham Greene. All these are and, Tavistock. These are all Tavistock writers, I'm sure. Very good. Yes, and within the movie, they also make many references. There's, there's, a, there's a, a large part of the movie dedicated to um, government mind control as well. Right. So there are many, many references to to the consumption of adrenochrome, even though they, they attempt to to to, um, to deny its existence. Terry Terence Gilliam. Um, the director of the movie of um, Fair and Loathing in, in, in um, Las, Las Vegas insisted that adrenochrome didn't exist. We feel that the issue regarding it is the fact that the adrenochrome has to be harvested from um, live donors due to its propensity to oxidize rapidly. After, after traumatizing those victims. Yes, and there's need, yeah, and this is what we trace back to because the children told us that, that the infants that were to be that were to be um, sacrificed, um, they were they were traumatized, and and um, and the children were also encouraged to rape to rape to rape these to sodomize these, these these infants, as well as throwing them up in the air, and allowing them to fall to the floor, um, allowing them to step into rat traps and various other types of them. Um, Raping them with their own pla own little plastic willies. Oh yes, the, the, the younger the, the younger members of the cult, um, the nine year olds, eight, seven, eight, you know, nine year olds, they were also uh, provided with their own strap on plastic dildos in order to to copy the adult sodomized the, 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 of, of, by the you know of the adults. So um, and this rite of sodomy, I, I'm, I, have we spoken about the? Um, the mechanics of this rite of sodomy. Um, uh, no, we haven't. Uh, let me interrupt. Interrupt for one thing, because yeah. I want to get back on adrenochrome too. Because I think that, I think that that's a money-making business that uh, we've talked about before. But uh, do you think that um, drinking uh, beverages made from hemp could serve as a uh, 
vehicle to get people off of blood drinking if they got into that? Most definitely, Paul, yes. Most okay. Definitely. I just wanted that to be stated. So. That's a, no, that's a good, very good point, yes. What did you say, Ella? So, yes, um, mainly because um, it's so nourishing and so satisfying um, as a food that um, you don't really crave anything else. Mm -hmm. you, you don't crave any more any stimulations because mm -hmm. you, you you get it all in your food you feel so good in your body and the this level of um, the heightened level of well-being I'm not talking about psychoactive um, of, of, of this food being psychoactive we're not talking about high from that we're talking about mm -hmm. the purely nutritional mm -hmm. point of view and um, the, the level of uh, well-being and um, the level of health you receiving via uh, consumption of this uh, amazing plant. Uh, so from this point of view, yes, definitely, it's a, it's it's a, definitely a, a solution. It's plus, a plus it's, a, it's a detoxifying agent as well, which um, helps to, um, I would imagine, to get rid of the any toxicity in the body um, uh, put there by by drugs this, or, or this particular diet or this the standard american diet as well what we call the sad diet you made a great point there paul we feel that yeah um that a lot of people are uh, maybe um attracted to this to the blood drinking they're attra attracted to the blood drinking due to the nutrient deficiency of the um, standard food supply as it were okay because of agribusiness and the over sort of um chemicalization of the soil the, the food, the soil in which the food is grown is, is, is nutrient deficient. So it follows that the food upon, which is grown upon this soil would, would also be nutrient deficient. And this is a general fare of, of, of the masses. And, we, you know, you've just made the point and it, and, and it makes perfect sense that people, many people would be attracted to drinking blood because it is so nutritious, it's so replete in nutrients, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Well, I want to, I want to, I want to follow up on two things that you were talking about. One is the the right of sodomy, but I, I want you to finish up with adrenochrome because we were talking before about that being a big business now. Oh, uh, the adrenochrome. Well, the, the issue with the adrenochrome is we we can't we can't be sure, and we don't really we don't really like to speculate. Okay. Over, because we don't want to we don't want to give the general public any any you know. And any false yeah, information. Yeah, yeah. However, to, to assume that uh, blood drinking is addictive because of the content of adrenochrome, yes. it uh, is. Yes. I think it's, it's, it makes sense. It's pretty valid. And uh, but of course, uh, they 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 been, they uh, <coughs> mentioned that the uh, the the scout have been uh, engaging, uh, been indulging in um, consumption of um, other uh, other uh, synthetic drugs. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah, they, they, apparently they're also taking cocaine and heroin. But the, the, with the adrenochrome, what happens with the adrenochrome is that it, one of the side effects apparently is ultra violence. And so, if these if these people are they're getting um, they're developing a type of bloodlust through the killing, and then they they consume the adrenochrome as a product of the killing, and that. Um, um, encourages them to commit more ultra violence. Then they, it's almost as if they're caught in a sort of closed loop, it, as if you know that the violence, the adrenochrome feeds the violence, and the violence provides more the death, and the murder provides more adrenochrome, and so they, they can become trapped in this closed loop. Right. And, what what I'm, vis and, I'm visualizing zombies. Well, you, yeah, you have mentioned this. Well, there we feel that they are in, in indoctrinating the children into this cult in order to create what we call a satanic, a satanic army. But getting back to the getting back to the to the adrenochrome and the blood drinking, Elisa told us about harvesting of the organs, the way in which they surgically cut and removed. She she graphically explained how she put her arms in and move and draw the the organs out of the children. Just, drag the organs out of the children. And she also explained that they were counting the number of children that were sacrificed. We feel that the headmistress, Miss Forsdyke, who was the head of admin for the cult, we feel they were keeping a record of the organs and the amount of 
infant they sacrificed. That's why we thought that maybe uh, that perhaps uh, organ trafficking and uh, perhaps adrenochrome harvesting is um is it could be um quite a um, it's not valid uh, yeah. um, assumption yeah how do you feel about that Paul? oh i think i think it's certainly is a, there's money always always linked to this stuff do you think there's a shelf life for the does the does the adrenaline dissipate into the blood or is it uh, something that could be commercially uh, or do the you yeah, maybe. The because the adrenochrome is an oxidation product. They call it pink because it goes a sort of a red or a pinkish color through the oxidation process. But I'm um, just saying whether or not, I don't really feel that it has much of a shelf life. I don't know if they can keep it in vials, little vials in the fridge apparently. If you can keep, but they say that it's, it's very expensive. And as it has to be harvested from live donors, it's a fat. It's a fat oh, it's and fat. alcohol soluble. We know uh, it's. it's a, there is limited information on this on this drug because they don't they don't want to, they they don't want you to know that it does it is that it exists. So, the same as satanic ritual abuse and child ritual child sacrifice and the rite of sodomy. They don't want you to know that these death cults exist. So they you know they they manipulate they manipulate and mind control the masses. Absolutely. Do you want to, in, the same, uh, in the same way they manipulate the masses to believe that cannabis is a is, is a, a drug, is a poison drug, and that the foods in the supermarkets masquerade that these drugs masquerading as foods in the supermarkets, they attempt to convince people that they're actually foods and they're nutritious when they're not. So there's you know, the degree of mass mind control by Tavistock and Rand. It, it feels that this feels that this um, this mass awakening that this is also uh, a part of of the mass awakening realization that people have been mass mind controlled to you know as to what to think what to wear what to eat when to laugh when to cry when to live and when to die absolutely do you want to, <clears throat> we've talked before about the rite of sodomy and how that particular act now this this is another thing that's becoming more and more acceptable in mainline culture and um but it's a very has a very devastating effect on on the young the people that engage in it. Do you want to go into that a little bit? And and on and on uh, on the on the consciousness of um of, uh, of our consciousness. own collective consciousness consciousness because um, committing those those acts those crimes and uh, torturing and making um, children suffer. I mean, what can we bring to it's on affecting, ourselves? It's affecting us what all. Karma, what kind yeah. of karma uh, yeah. is coming to us? It's affecting us all on an energetic level, Paul, not solely the people who are the victims of this. So we'll go to the right of that's why That's why animal slaughtering is also carries, carries enormous um, amount of negative effect on our consciousness as well. You know, they're like... Um, Something six, six or eight million uh, animals are slaughtered every minute. Another thing about the animals, these very same animals, Paul, over which we have dominion, which means we have dominion over them, we're supposed to take care of them, not eat them. These very same animals, no animal, no animal cooks its food on the planet. Humans are the only animal that cooks their food. And no animals rape and sodomize ritually kill their own. Only humans do this. Right? And it's human adults. Because human adults are mutants. We are adulterated children. And this is why these cult members, they, they, they despise children and they want to steal the purity of the children. And the rite of sodomy is one of the mechanics whereby they attempt to do this. So by sodomizing the children, also they have, they have tools which they they use and they they, they, they insert into the into the anal passage of the children. Demon has become adept at doing this, and this is what he was accused of. This is the crime they were questioning him about in the on the fifteenth of September, which he obfuscated and he avoided answering the question. Okay, so the right of sodomy we understand in modern times was passed on. The knowledge was passed on by Alistair Crowley to the um, to the Illuminati. Um, Illuminati, was it to the Illuminati or to the Masonic cult? But it, mm -hmm. much young, much younger. Uh, they, of uh, course, but yeah. I'm talking the modern, the modern, the modern interpretation. See, what Alistair Crowley has taught them that by manipulating 
nerves at the base of the spine. They activate or they stimulate kundalini energy up the spine and they, they it, what it does, it activates the pineal gland, the third eye. And the children... Forcefully, artificially. That's very good. Mechanically, that's right. They, they activate the pineal gland, the third eye, and the third eye, and the children get glass, uh, glimpses. Are you still there? Yes. The children, the, the victims, they, 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 they get flashes and glimpses of the third eye opening, but it, it becomes a light, it, illum it illuminates. And this is one of the... Re they get, they're getting glimpses of the cosmic consciousness. This is what they get, glimpses of cosmic consciousness. And the, the, the third eye lights up or illuminates, and this is one of the... Um, where the term Illuminati comes from, allegedly. One of the, re the places that the Illuminati... Because they, they illuminate the third eye. The children get a glimpse of, the, of um, cosmic consciousness. They get addicted to this, uh, this connection with, this, with the divine. And well, this stimulation, kind of like perverted way of connection with yes, the divine, I would say. But it's still a glimpse of divinity, yeah, yeah. nonetheless. However, the stimulation of the of the base at the base chakra of the of the nerve end it keeps them, as you mentioned, as you mentioned yesterday, it keeps them trapped in the lower chakra and dependent on the uh, on the uh, stimulator on the stimulator. So they become bound and controlled by the one who is enacting these, this, this um, right of sodomy upon them. And this is how we feel CIA, MI5 and these other operatives are um, creating mind controlled sex slaves, much like the case in Jakarta International School, where Barry Sotoro, Barack Obama attended. And um, also we, during our research, we actually found out that many of those agents are themselves mind control sex slaves as well. Mm -hmm. I would so, say yeah. I would say so. I think it's I think it's probably rampant in those organizations. The organ those organizations, CIA, which came out of the OSS, MI five, MI six, those people are as trapped as, as anybody, I would say. You know, I don't know whether my listeners remember, but we've talked about Alistair Crowley before. He's considered himself to be the evilest man alive, people called him the beast. He okay. brags of, of killing 180 young boys and uh, sodomizing them, of course. Uh, yeah. I don't know whether before or after, but sodomizing them because he felt, <laughs> get this, that the anus was a stargate. And so you're connecting that with the pineal gland uh, yeah. really makes a lot of sense. So the whole thing is, it's it's a whole like it's a whole culture outside of humanness, this perversion of humanness, this degrading of humanness, turning them into slaves, slaves yeah. to consume flesh, slaves to consume, and this adrenochrome, why wow, that's a that's a major uh, that's a major thing we all need to be need to be aware of. Well, they're anti-human, they're anti-human, they're they're mutated and. All adults are mutants, you know, only children are real. And this is why they attempt to steal the real, pure divinity of children. This is their attempt. However, these, these um, cult members, they appear to have mutated even further. Uh, so yeah. we, have to, we have to bring them back into the fold. That, that's so encouraging. That's so encouraging. I hope that somebody that's in one of these cults or two or three people decide that they want to join the human race again. Okay. They, want to, they, want to, they want to get their humanness back. They want to get their caring get back. They want to get real again. Hopefully they have, uh, they have enough little bit of humanity left in them to realize that this is the right way to, this is the right thing to do. Because salvation is for everyone, Paul. You know, salvation is for everyone. I believe it. And, you know, and without love and forgiveness, we're not really getting very far anyway. Exactly. However, we would like to say this. Ella's been, been prompting me to, to remark, to let everybody, to let our listening audience know that Satanism is an, accept, is an accepted religion in the armed forces. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> 
And not just in the armed forces, but apparently in a large part of society has accepted Satanism as their religion without actually realizing that they've done this because it's endemic in the culture. Right. So. But World Beyond Belief is going to do something about that. We're going to try to do everything we can. The four of us are going to keep going on this until we can, maybe we can get a parade of people uh, to sign up and start uh, start the, uh, what can we call it, the rehab. This is the ultimate rehab, isn't it? All oh, right, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So it can be done. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, some, uh, some. Uh, we could all do some rehabilitation, I'm sure. Yes, I'm sure we can. Of course, uh, you know, which, uh, which, uh, where we can come with, uh, with everything that is diff that is opposite to what they're preaching. Yes, that theirs is a cult of reversal from Subtai to the a cult of, or was it, was it Jacob Frank? Cult it, the cult of reversal, the satanic cult of reversal. Yeah. Teaching, teaching the, the followers to do the exact opposite of the of the sacred scriptures. So. Well, if you yeah. go, if you if you study the archons, that's what they do. They take whatever, whatever's natural, and then they invert it. And I always use the example of a candy bar. You know, the uh, the, the the earth and and God, I guess, created an apple, which is a great. It's a health food. It's on health diets. It's delicious, um, but the but the archonic influence, the, the I'm going to say the satanic influence, makes the Mars bar. Now I love the Mars bar, but but it comes in a wrapper that's not biodegradable. I've never seen it on any health food diet in my life. It contains a lot of sugar, and sugar is connected with the calcification of the pineal gland. It's connected with triglycerides, heart attacks. I mean. It's 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 a bastardization of this beautiful, wonderful apple. So I, I always think that that's what they do with the world. Everything they touch is a perversion. Very good. You can see you've done that's some true. research, Paul. Yes, I, a little bit. <laughs> I've read a book. The chocolate also contains um, theobromine, powerful nerve toxin, which causes children to wet the bed as well sometimes. So, yeah, chocolate is really not not a health food, although it does contain, you know, quite a bit of magnesium, which is good for the heart. So if you could, <laughs> I'd love to figure out a way to make chocolate really healthy, because uh, I'm, I'm kind of a... We've got a recipe, we've got a chocolate recipe for your healthy chocolate. We call it, it's called the dream cream. We'll have to, yeah, we'll have to, yeah, we'll send that to you. Great. Well, I think you guys are the dream team. I you think know. they picked the wrong people to mess around with. I'm, and I'm definitely, I'm definitely, yeah, they made a mistake there. They made a mistake. Yeah. Well, especially they made got, a mistake with, uh, with, uh, with uh, us and with children. Definitely, and they made a mistake because we've got friends like you supporting us and getting the information out there to the people. So and they, many, many, many uh, amazing people around the globe as well. To assist, in our, to assist in our collective consciousness awakening. Great, and we'll link up to the bottom of this world beyond belief, ways to get in touch with you, ways to get in touch with us, because we're going to start an army on the other side. And it's not an army, it's an army of love. Most definitely. Most Absolutely. Definitely. We're getting a lot of calls. We're getting a lot of calls from our, from our friends. They're, asking, they're saying they want more Mindy. I don't know what they mean. What do they mean when they're saying they want more Mindy? You know what they're talking about? <laughs> she's, a, she's, a rare, she's a rare quality. She's a rare quantity here. Go ahead, say something. Say something. Oh, I try just to wait until I have something worthwhile saying rather than just chiming in. So right. when the time um, comes, I have something to say. You'll hear more from me. Thank you. Thank I'm you. like Abraham with his away. Yeah, well done, Mindy. Thank you, Abraham. <laughs> Appreciate your encouragement. Take care, and, and thank you guys very, very much. And uh, World Beyond Belief will be hearing a lot from you guys in subsequent editions. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so Take much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right. Well, that was a dynamic interview and certainly a fun interview for Mindy and us, and I'm sure it was for Ella and Abraham also. But let's get serious for a moment. Everybody's 
saying, well, the, the TPP is coming in. Uh, the Bilderberg Group are making plans. They're going to sign our new leaders. They're working with Google to shut us down. But what can we do? Well, now there's no more excuse. Now you know exactly what to do. I'm going to give you three or four things off the top of my head that we can start doing right now that'll end this thing. Remember, this is their power supply. When they get exposed, when normal human beings hear of this, they're going to be appalled. They're going to, they're going to stop their support and they'll cut off their, their supply of blood, their supply of victims. So the first thing I want you to do, if you want to do this, is to get knowledgeable about this case, get knowledgeable about there are other cases going on in France now, all over Europe, and there are certainly cases in the United States. Get knowledgeable about what's going on there. Uh, in England, there's you can spend uh, two days just reading about the different politicians that are implicated in MI6 and the CIA that are implicated in child trafficking over there for this precise energy purpose. Get knowledgeable, get conversational so that you can talk to anybody uh, about this. That's the first step. Second step is spread the word. Make sure that everybody that you know knows that this is going on and how catastrophic this whole thing is. Make sure that they're doing something. I mean, I don't know whether you have a little church group, uh, whether you have a group on Facebook, whether you're making podcasts like Mindy and I are, whatever you're doing, get the word out. Get a group that knows about this stuff. Because my notion is that if 50% of the population knows that this is going on, knows how, how it looks graphically, knows the details of this stuff, that's the end of it. They're not going to put up with it anymore. And there's, I think, the, well, I think how it'll happen is it'll come down in England first. Not that this isn't happening all over the world, but it'll come down in England first because there's so much stuff out there on what's going on in England and what's, what's happening there. Second of all, it'll probably spread to Europe and second of all, and third of all, it'll bring down the American establishment. We can replace them amazingly with people that aren't victims of satanic abuse or in, and not in satanic cults themselves. It's going to be hard to find a politician that's now in power that's not either one of them or is heavily influenced by them. Uh, the other thing I want you to do, if you want to do this, is start protecting your children at home. Uh, Child Protective Services and the police are not anywhere to go when uh, someone in your neighborhood is in trouble. There are books written now. We just have on the, on the end of uh, Podcast 133, we have an interview yeah. that Luke Rudkowski does with uh, um, Carlos, Carlos Morales. And he's written a book on this, how Child Protective Services has a quota, and they have to meet these quotas to kidnap this many children. So make yourself aware of that. Make yourself aware of what's going on in your neighborhood. Don't call Child Protective Services. Solve it internally. Get the neighbors together. Do something internally. So I think that's what we should do to stop the ravishing of our beautiful planet and of our wonderful humanity, human consciousness, by this, this disease, this plague, this distortion, this death cult that seems to have a stranglehold on us. Can you imagine what it would be like if 50% of the people in the world, or just in the United States and Europe, including UK, knew that this was going on and knew how horrible it was and knew that their leaders were the ones that were perpetrating this. So, bless you. Go out, spread the word. I hope this was fun for you to watch or at least interesting and enlightening. Uh, that's all. That's the end of this world beyond belief. Be nice to one another. Bye bye. By the way, before we leave you with this week's episode, we're going to play a couple little clips. 
that Abraham wanted you to see. And we'll leave you with that. Thank you so much for tuning in to the World Beyond Belief. Catch you next week. Bye-bye. While we're on the subject of Papa Hem, and just to clear up a couple of things, Abraham formed a private nutritional research organization called Hemp Seed Organics in 1996, which developed a bit of a cult following. They were the first company to put hemp seed on the shelves of the Whole Food stores in small brown recycled paper packets. And they established a base at Spitalfield's Organic Fruit and Veg Market till to about 2004, where they disseminated hemp seed nutritional information as well as information about raw food. Now, the company was required by Planet Organic to mark their packets of hemp seed with the ubiquitous 666 barcode. Abraham was adamant that the packets should not bear this 666 barcode. And so, have a feeling that they'd ful fulfilled their remit of reintroducing hemp as a foodstuff, he began in earnest on research. In 2013, Abraham received an honorary doctorate from Dr. Anek Westra for his work showing how the fresh juice of hemp incorporating leaves, seeds and flowers supplied an ideal plant-based blood transfusion liquid for humans. Yeah. Okay. And is there anything you don't like about Papa Hemp? No, it never hurts me. No, never. but what about other things? Is there anything at all you don't like? No. no? And what about Papa Hemp? Yes. What's he like? He's kind, but when, I, when, he, when we were telling him all about this, yeah. on the holidays in Morocco, yeah. we, because we, we, we were scared to tell, of yeah. course, so we lied a bit. We lied a lot, though. Okay. We lied a lot, but then we were so scared and terrified when, they, when he found out about it. Because the first time he's like, right, Elisa and Gabriel, somebody's touching you, and I know it's what, who it is. He said and that to I you. said, and then we just gave up, and we just said, "My dad." What do you mean you gave so up? So we, so we like, we gave up the, the, we gave up the deal with our dad, but to not to tell anyone about this or okay. mom, anyone. Okay. But then we just gave up the deal. We just told him that's our dad, and then we carry on okay. telling. But that time, we were terrified to tell all about this okay. baby steal, a baby killing, and all this. <laughs>40 different medicines. She had been on methotrexate um, and Plaquenil, one of those which nearly destroyed her vision. All the potent anti-inflammatories, the Vioxx and the Celebrex, and was on all sorts of painkillers and all sorts of antibiotics. But she had classic steroid toxicity. Her face was the shape of a moon because there's a lot of, of swelling that occurs in the face. At the age of 16, was diagnosed with a juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And that evolved into a lupus condition, a diagnosis of interstitial cystitis, an autoimmune disorder. And bedridden four years. Her mother thought she would never survive. I went to talk to William as a friend and as a doctor about his experience with patients and how they use cannabis. Seeing what the juicing did for me, using it in this form was so significant, it changed my life. About four to six weeks after I started on juicing every day, I had no more back pain, I didn't need pain pills, I felt the best I ever had. A lot of people think cannabis and pot are you know, not medicine. I had stumbled on an article in Scientific American in uh, December 2004. They had an article on marijuana as the brain's own marijuana. And they introduced the idea that 
the body produces uh, compounds that are very similar to those found in marijuana or cannabis. Cannabis actually goes upstream and provides feedback from the postsynaptic nerve to the presynaptic nerve, which was unheard of in neurochemistry. I mean, all neurotransmissions were unidirectional, and all of a sudden, swimming against the force of that are these little cannabinoid molecules that tie the whole system together. The phytocannabinoids from this plant augment the body's attempt to restore and increase function to a normal level. So. It mimics the regulatory system of cellular physiology. And recently the Food and Drug Administration has approved of CBD, which is a cannabinoid like THC, one of 80 cannabinoids. The federal patent compares vitamin C, vitamin E, and CBD or cannabidiol. CBD turns out to be more potent than either of those two. The thing that I warn my patients of is if you're going to be juicing this flower and this leaf and you're going to be doing this high dose non psychoactive cannabinoid dietary approach, please do not heat it. When you heat cannabis, you make it psychoactive, which for a large part of the community, um, the psychoactivity of a plant is a measure of its medical quality. Um, but it's really quite the inverse. If you heat or age cannabis in any way, you're destroying some of the medicinal properties of it. To use the plant effectively, we have to use it the way it evolved over 34 million years, which is raw, because when it's raw, the THC is bound up as THC acid. It requires aging, drying, so as a hunter-gatherer, we gather this plant and we notice, wow, as this plant ages, it changes character and suddenly has a psychoactive effect. I think that's the most exciting area of cannabis research is looking at non-psychoactive cannabinoids. Because if you do heat it, you'll decarboxylate the THC acid, and you're gonna have 600 milligrams of THC acid with the CBD acid. You would be unconscious probably for the better part of the week. Between um, heating the plant, whether that's in a sucker, a cookie, a baked good, um, a butter, vaporized, smoked, all of those uh, techniques um, convert THC acid, which is non-psychoactive, into THC, and provide you with that 10 milligram dose. Um, but if you eat the plant raw, um, then THC acid is the way it's found in the plant. It's not psychoactive. The juicing allows you to get up to the 500 to 600 milligrams, which is 60 times more than you could tolerate if it was heated. This treatment is not psychoactive. People don't have to be stoned when they take it. They can take it and go to work. They can take it and play with their kids. It's hard for me to to understand laws against something like green leaf therapy and to think that prednisone is legal. We're still fighting the, the stigma of uh, marijuana back from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. I was a prosecutor for eight years in Mendocino County, so I know it from both as a defense attorney and as a prosecutor. The 1972 Controlled Substances Act said that marijuana has no medical value whatsoever. The federal government has a patent on its medical properties. The Food and Drug Administration has approved of it as investigative new drug. I have not found the United States to be very open about cannabis research. In order to print an article in a peer-reviewed journal, you have to use cannabis that they have certified for your study. And there are physicians who have waited three, four, five, six years, some even longer than that, to just get a sample. The federal government's been kind of schizophrenic in the way it looks at marijuana. It says it has no medical value under that act, but at the same time, the federal government has been funding research in marijuana for years, for decades. And they've even patented certain strains of marijuana because they recognize it has its that medical value. The California Narcotic Officers Association does not believe in medical marijuana. They believe it's all a big scam, and that's how they train law enforcement officers. Law enforcement is allowed to take a percentage of all assets that are forfeited and seized under the state and federal asset forfeiture law. So it takes the really enlightened and compassionate law enforcement officer to recognize that these medical marijuana laws are designed to protect patients. I was trained when someone had marijuana, you took them to jail. There wasn't a medicine use for, for marijuana. It's an illegal substance, and people went to jail for it. In 1996, California took a huge leap. Uh, I didn't support Proposition 215 because of the uh, education I had, the experience I had, and what I had seen through the illegal marijuana gardens that I had seen throughout my career. Since 1996, I have changed my opinion somewhat. I believe there is a very clear medicinal use for marijuana. That being said, I believe that there are 
a, a large percentage of people who use marijuana as an excuse to either make profits or for recreational. The, uh, the, the people who use marijuana for the true intended use that the voters pass, medicinal, I'll do everything I can to support their rights. There's many more things that law enforcement can be focused on than medicinal marijuana. And I, I don't want to give the impression at all that I support people who are growing marijuana for medical purposes 364 days of the year, and then one day a year they make a big sale for a couple hundred thousand dollars, and, and they're a, a commercial seller that one day of the year. They're the people who are causing problems for the people who really and truly need and can use medical marijuana. Terrifying, you know, to be told as a parent that your child does have a tumor in, in her brain. It took 24 hours in the operating room. They gave us a 10% chance of survival with treatment. At the Oakland Children's Hospital, where they called me and they said they had a baby who they were discharging home. They had, this baby had completed all treatment that would be useful for it, had brain tumor, excuse me, um, had, uh, had surgery, had radiation and chemo, and the tumors were still growing and still multiplying. Um, and therefore they, they said to the parents, just take this baby home and make it comfortable. Uh, because there's nothing more that we know that will help its condition. Started to accept the to the point where the illness had taken her and us and try and find some acceptance. A month went by and I got in contact with the family and they said, well, we just came back from Children's Hospital. They did a CAT scan. The tumors have shrunk and there are fewer of them. And they said, I'll tell you, what we've been doing, we've been juicing the fan leaves of the marijuana plant and giving this our baby a shot glass of this juice every day. This is like this wonderful hospice story. She is no longer on hospice. Um, I brought the oxygen concentrator back. Um, it's, it's just one of those wonderful success stories. This, you know, the plant is a pretty amazing plant because it appears that the juice of this plant is, is saving this baby's life. Here we have something that can really change people's lives. I mean, I was laying in bed, catheterized, thinking that physicians were just trying to make me comfortable. They really didn't think that there was anything more that they could do and that I may not live to be 30, which I am now, that that was the best I could hope for. The best I could hope for was taking enough Macedone and Percocet every day that I just didn't feel anything at all. I had been gotten in touch with Dr. Courtney because we had received a doctor's recommendation from one of his patients, and in it it asked that they start juicing the leaves and having capsules and a few other items which I didn't know anything about. So after I contacted him, I was really excited to hear that there might be some other alternatives to um, the smoking of the cannabis. These are friends we've had in the past year. They said, uh, your father's not the same as he was when we first met him. And he's, he seems to be much more alive and much, you know, doing a lot more and more active. And I had informed them that it was because of the juice that he had been taking. Right after we started juicing that he seemed to be more active. You know, we would do things out in the garage more and he wouldn't spend so much time in his chair. But we have ran, ran out uh, periodically in the last year and a half. And uh, that's what made me convinced that he needed it because when he would run out, he would have trouble getting out of the car. I had four doctors tell me that I should have a hysterectomy. You either have no ovaries or at the very least you're sterile. That my endometriosis was so bad I would never be able to have a child. Despite very potent birth control, despite being sterile, Zahaya decided she was going to come join the party. <laughs> ourselves by being extremely scientific and people know that if they're going to come to us they're going to have to go through a lot of hoops but they're also going to get the most up-to-date scientific knowledge on this subject and they're going to see a physician who's an expert in the field of non-psychoactive cannabinoids.
and there are plenty of people that want that and are looking for that. We opened um, our fifth office in Luxembourg. Their government is really sympathetic and open. There's an international group studying autism and CBD in, in Luxembourg. There's a physician there who's writing cannabis scripts who's also a senator. And we've been working with him, Senator Colombera. The government may be actually funding experiments in a research center using cannabis in large part because of Dr. Courtney's work with non-psychoactive cannabinoids and Senator Columbera's work with cancer patients. There are now facilities for testing uh, plants and there's been more progress made in the last five to six months. A new strain in from Spain called Canatonic, 6.9% CBD. Uh, that's a 700% increase over Northern Lights, which is our previous high producer. I would like to find strains that have all of the cannabinoids present in an amount that's useful. I'd like to produce strains that are adapted to environment. In Luxembourg, we're producing thousands and thousands of pounds of seed. You know, to raise the money to give away you know, a half a pound of seed, because if that person grows an acre of cannabis and feeds their family the proteins are set and the fatty acids. I mean, incredible food source, an incredible preventative medicine source, and an incredible therapeutic source. And at the same time, they're sucking five times as much CO2 out of the environment um, as, as an acre of trees. First, we have to change convention treaty number one, which was the convention that the UN put out in 1961 that says cannabis as a crime should be, if you have it, if you grow it, if it's in your possession, you should be in prison. That dogma has dominated the world uh, right now. Um, they're look, asking for input from the World Health Organization and the process of writing a letter stating that you know, this is a dietary essential, it's not a criminal thing, because we have to change that treaty before we can go into Central South America and say, you know, here's, here, grow yourself an acre of this plant, feed your family, prevent illnesses. So Cannabis International kind of legalizing the plant globally, giving it back to people as a food source, prevent illness is so much better than waiting until you have diseases. With my own experience and all the patients that I've spoken to, I believe that it's not an isolated incident, that this is the best medication 